Hello again. Today we are looking at the hardware board to upgrade the 2U server case with. The CPU is an AMD Ryzen 7 5700G. The G means it has integrated graphics. There are four 16 gig DDR4 DIMMs, making a total of 64 gig of RAM. As I'm going to be running many VMs and possibly a second true NAS server, the more RAM the better. For storage, as you can see from the picture, a lot of options, but I'm not entirely sure yet what I'll do. The motherboard only seems to want to boot from an NVMe drive, so I've got a small 256 gig Gen 3 disk. For storing the VMs, I'm probably going to use two 512 gig SSDs and a stripe. This is not actually a good idea, as you may get lots of storage space and it will be very fast, but there is no redundancy. If either of the disks fail, then you lose all of the data. So to mitigate this, I've got two one terabyte hard drives, but I'll probably only use one as it will have enough storage space to back up all of the VMs. I'll just set up a con job to do this. There are a couple of expansion cards I'm thinking of using. An old graphics card, which I'll probably use with my Plex server for media transcoding, and a two port gigabit NIC. I'm thinking of setting up a router server to manage my internet connection and other related services using OpenSense or PFSense or similar software. For this, you have to have two spare network ports. As I've not got an internet connection faster than one gigabyte, then this is more than fast enough. I took the old motherboard out of the case off camera as I knew it would be a fiddly job and thus not very exciting to watch. Before I put the new motherboard in the case, I want to turn it on to make sure that I can at least boot into Windows 11 to test out some of the hardware. As you can see from the picture, I connected up an old SSD with Windows 11 installed on it, but I just couldn't get the motherboard to see it as a boot device. I could see it in the BIOS though. I therefore had to install the NVMe drive, but as it's under a heatsink, you can't actually see it in this picture. I've not connected up the Arctic P8 case fans as I want to keep the number of connected items to minimum just in case there is an issue. Let's turn the machine on and see how we get on. If you look just under the left hand side of the monitor, there are two USB 2 header connectors. I had to disconnect these as it was stopping the machine from posting. It seems that the header on the motherboard is different to the old motherboard and it just doesn't like the new connector. Posting or post stands for power on self test. This is the first thing the motherboard does before or allowing the system to boot. Basically just test that what is connected is working. The first time I turn on a new motherboard and CPU combination, I always find it nerve wracking. There is always a chance that you did something wrong and you have destroyed an expensive component or components. I managed to do this with my first computer by connecting up the power supply cables the wrong way around. It completely fried the motherboard. Nowadays, it's very hard to damage anything, but I still worry. The motherboard took about one minute to post and this was a very long minute, I can tell you. You. But it's showing the post screen now, so let's go into the BIOS and check out the hardware and change a few settings. As a new CPU to the motherboard has been installed, it wants to reset all the BIOS settings. As this is the first time I've turned it on, it, this isn't an issue. But I took this CPU out of my true NAS server and that motherboard did the same thing. It's very annoying as I had to go through and set up everything again. It does support profiles, but I didn't know I needed to set this up before I made the swap. I pressed Y to reset the BIOS. We are in the BIOS now and I can see from the top left that the system is only showing as having 56 gig of RAM. I reset I reseated the memory later on and this fixed it, but I didn't record the fixed memory displaying. Despite the boot sequence on the bottom left showing the SSD, the middle option, it wouldn't actually boot from it. I forgot to also record turning on XMP profiles for the memory. This allows the memory to run at faster speeds. Let's change some settings. AC back. This will turn the machine back on after a power loss. This shouldn't be an issue hopefully as I have a UPS, but I've turned it on anyway. Soft off by power button. I've set it to four seconds. This means if you accidentally press the power button, the machine won't turn off. You have to hold it for four seconds. Resize bar support. This is useful for games, but I'm hoping that Plex can use it for transcoding. It might help, I don't know. Network stack. This is set to on. This allows me to boot from the network card. I've turned off IPv4 HTTPS and both IPv6 options as they aren't needed. LEDs in a system power on state. This turns off the LED lights on the motherboard as I hate RGB lighting. Boot up numlock state. I've set it to off as my keyboard doesn't have a separate number keypad. Let's save the settings and turn the machine off. 
I've installed the motherboard and components into the case now and put the lid back on. So let's get booted up into Windows 11 and do a few things like update the BIOS and some benchmarks. There is a BIOS update, so I'll get that installed and reboot. I've connected up the two 512 gig SSDs and I'll use the Windows Disk Manager app to set up a stripe. This will give me the maximum performance utilizing both disks at the same time when reading and writing. For a comparison, I'll benchmark just one of the disks so that we can see the difference. Let's run the disk benchmarks using Crystal Disk Mark. The results for the NVMe disk is very impressive. And now I'm thinking that I want to change the setup to boot from an SSD and use the NVMe for VM storage. The single SSD speed is acceptable and the addition of a second disk in a stripe gives about a 50% increase in speed and will be acceptable for hosting VMs. Now let's do a CPU benchmark using Cinebench R23. It takes about 10 minutes to complete, so I'll speed through it. We have a result and I have no idea if it's good for the platform or not. But one thing I did notice is that the CPU is thermal throttling. If you look at the CPU frequency, it looks to be maybe 500 megahertz lower than the max boost speed. The CPU core I have is the one that came with the CPU, and I don't think I'm going to look to replace it with one that can handle more heat, as 500 megahertz lower speed is fine. The machine is very unlikely to ever be run hard enough for this to be an issue. I'm really pleased with all the parts fitted into the case with no issues and the existing power supply supports it. Finally, let's look at the costs. The motherboard cost me £100. The CPU already had, but it cost me around £200. The memory was £73 for two 16 gig DIMMs, so £146 for 64 gig. The case fans cost me £9 each, so £27 in total. All of the discs and the dual port NIC I had for a long time and were cheap, but I don't remember how much they did cost. So the rough total is £273, but if you include the expensive CPU I already had, then it's £473. For the spec and capability, I think this is a really good price. I do still need to get a shelf for the server rack, but I'm hoping this will be around £25. If you shop around, you can definitely save money on the memory and CPU. I think about £50 maybe. This would pay for the rack shelf. The links for the motherboard, memory, CPU and case fans are in the description if you're interested in getting any of the components I'm using. Thanks for watching, like and subscribe and all that jazz.